Gamar Hatima Tova to everyone. I haven't even started yet. <laughs> At the beginning of time, God's presence filled the universe. When God decided to bring this world into being, to make room for creation, God first drew in God's breath, contracting God's self. From that contraction, darkness was created. And when God said, let there be light, the light that came into being filled the darkness. And 10 holy vessels came forth, each filled with that primordial light. In this way, God sent forth those 10 vessels like a fleet of ships, each carrying its cargo of light. Had they all arrived intact, the world would have been perfect. But the vessels were too fragile to contain such a powerful divine light. They broke open, split asunder, and all the holy sparks were scattered around like sand, like seeds, like stars. Those sparks fell everywhere. That is why we were created, to gather the sparks, no matter where they are hidden. God created the world so that we would raise up the holy sparks. And when enough holy sparks have been gathered, the broken vessels will be restored. And tikkun olam, the repair of the world, awaited for so long, will finally be complete. Therefore, it should be the aim of everyone to raise these sparks from wherever they are imprisoned and to elevate them to holiness by the power of the soul. The Arizal Rabbi Yitzhak Loria created this story in the 16th century to explain not only the creation of the universe, but the origin of the brokenness of the world. He lived, of course, at the time after the expulsion from Spain and folks focused much of his religious thought about a god in exile and a world in need of cosmic repair. This story teaches that brokenness is the ontological state of the world and the human condition. We sin, brokenness didn't originate with humanity, though of course we contribute to it. We sin and we make mistakes, we are complacent, and we suppress and ignore and dim the light. Ultimately, this story gives human beings a profound role and the repair in the world. In it, we lift up and restore the light. We fix what is broken through the gathering of the sparks. We are the tikkun for the odam. That's the grand story that the Arizal tells. But tonight, Kol Nidre is all about what is broken. Broken vows and promises, broken dreams, we acknowledge all that is shattered and incomplete, and we dwell in the depth of the emptiness, the sorrow, the exile, and the mourning. So why is it that after Kol Nidre and Shechianu that we sing a nigun here that is filled with joy? First of all, we're here. We're alive. That is no small thing for some of us. Some of us didn't expect to be here. Some of us wished that others were here. Some of us don't know whether we'll be here next year. That's true for all of us. It's not to be taken for granted that we're sitting in our seats here. Comfortable seats, by the way, right? <laughs> but a piece of the joy, I think, comes from what I recited right before Kol Nidre. We are free to pray with all those that have transgressed. We can finally tell the truth and be our broken selves amongst all the other broken human beings by our sides. 
In this moment, we let go of our pretense. We stop posting perfect pictures of ourselves and our families on Facebook and Instagram. We don't pretend. There is a certain freedom in letting go and not having to be perfect or successful or the best. It's actually a relief. And so here we are, human beings shattered in a broken world. And we'll say tomorrow in Seder Avodah, the Seder Avodah is interpreted by Ishai Rebo, the Israeli singer. And if a person could remember the flaws, the shortcomings, all the transgressions, all the wrongdoings, thus they would surely count one, one and one, one and two, one and three, one and four, one and five. They would give up right away because they wouldn't be able to bear the bitterness, the sin, the shame, the missed opportunity, the loss. Not all that is broken can be repaired. We live with that truth and regret. We can't rewind. Some things are irreversible. We can only apologize. We can atone. We can ask for forgiveness. The ritual of these 25 hours of Yom Kippur is to learn to live with the broken pieces, the ontological pieces and what we ourselves have broken, to figure out how and what we might repair, to learn from what we have shattered, and get in touch with our own fragility in it all. Yom Kippur is actually the culmination of a long process that began with another breaking, according to the Midrash, the breaking of, anyone know? It's a quiz. <laughs> the tablets, the breaking of the tablets. Yes, whoever, five points for whoever said that. According to the Midrash on the 17th of Tammuz, three weeks before Tisha B'Av, Moshe descended from his 40-day retreat with God on Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, with the tablets. And what did he find upon his return? Very good. <laughs> we're increasing our uh, responsiveness. The Israelites worshiping the golden calf. At that moment, he smashed the tablets. And then, of course, he ascended the mountain once again for 40 days. And on this very day, Yom Kippur, tomorrow afternoon, says the tradition, he brought down the second tablets. Our tradition has much more to say about that moment of breaking. It doesn't stick with one simple story. Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer, a 19th, a 9th century midrash, teaches that Moshe took the, mount, took the tablets and went down the mountains and that actually the letters themselves carried Moshe and the tablets. The letters of the commandments were that powerful. And when the letters saw the instruments and the people dancing around the golden calf, the letters flew off the tablets. And the tablets became so heavy that Moshe could no longer carry them. And he threw them out of his hands and they broke. According to the Midrash, Moshe didn't break the tablets in frustration or anger. The constitution, actually, of the tablets changed. Moshe could only carry the weight of the tablets when the holiness of the letters carried them. Without the letters, the tablets were unbearable. The Safan Emet, another a Hasidic master, adds to this story, and he says, only as the light of Torah is engraved and incised on the hearts of Israel are the letters incised on the tablets as well. The real writing is on the heart. The letters flew off when Israel sinned because the tablets included the commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. And the Israelites, of course, were worshiping, worshiping another god, worshiping the golden calf. The law is only as holy as the people's readiness to receive it. 
The brokenness comes from their sin and inauthenticity. The Torah can only be carried by those who truly embrace it in their hearts. Another story told by Rashi places the responsibility of the breaking of the tablets directly on Moshe. In fact, and this is an amazing midrash, instead of chastising Moshe for this outbreak of anger or disbelief, God congratulates Moshe, using a play on words because it says that you broke a sher shibarta, and God actually, according to Rashi, says yeshur koach for breaking the tablets. Good for you for breaking the tablets. Why? If the Israelites were not worthy of receiving Torah, then the Torah could not be lived out. The breaking, that rupture, makes possible for there to be recreating and rebuilding. Reish Lakish teaches in the Talmud, sometimes Torah's actual nullification is its very foundation. It's a radical idea. Sometimes Torah's nullification, breaking it, is actually the foundation of Torah. A new Torah, the second tablets that are received on this very day emerged. And according to the tradition, they were not just the original Ten Commandments, but they, they contain the halakha, the law, and the midrash, and were also included. Everything was included in the second tablets, unlike the first that only had the Ten Commandments. The breaking allowed for the interpretive tradition to be born, a radical, creative, and transformational act. Yet another story deepens this moment even further. The Meshech Chochmah, Rabbi Meir Simcha of Dvinsk, you say that five times, Dvinsk, 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 um, who lived from 1843 to 1946, teaches that Moshe's breaking of the tablets was not impulsive at all, but deliberate. Moshe saw the Israelites dancing around the golden calf and realized if he would, break, if he would bring them the tablets, they would start dancing around them too and turn them into another fetish, a replacement for the golden calf. And so, he broke them, lest the tablets themselves be worshipped as an idol. This powerful story provides a deep insight into the human soul. The golden calf represents a replacement for the immediate connection with God and Moshe, God's prophet. Its shiny appeal is superficial. Inside, it is empty. The Meshe Chochmah reminds us even the most sacred things can be turned into idols. And so Moshe, fearful that the tablets would be worshipped and not lived, breaks them. Sometimes things fall apart because the love and dedication they need or deserve is not inscribed in our hearts when we are not being authentic in our commitment. Sometimes things break because we have forgotten why they were important. But in the breaking, there is an opportunity to reimagine and rebuild. And sometimes the breaking is the shattering of an idol, the inevitable downfall of something or someone who appears per perfect, mythic almost. The stories of our tradition tell us about brokenness they're meant to help us dig deeper into moments of rupture, to ask questions. Was the breaking deliberate or intentional, unintentional? Is there a better outcome possible even with the pain and betrayal of what was ruptured? Was I not wholehearted in a commitment and that is why it failed? Was the breaking necessary to avoid a worse outcome? It is impossible to speak of brokenness and shattering in this moment without discussing Israel. Through our exile of 2,000 years, with its travails and triumphs, the Jewish people sustain their longing to return home through prayers and poetry, and ultimately the work of hands, hearts, and souls. Brave and courageous people struggled to build a vibrant life on the land well before the establishment of the state. 
In 1948, that dream became realized, and though I wasn't alive at the time, I have heard so many stories of what it felt like to witness that miracle, particularly coming out of the ashes of the Shoah. No longer were we a people escorted to the crematoria like sheep to the slaughter, but a strong people, tanned and tough, establishing the land not with prayers, but planting one tree after the next in the heat of the sun. The Declaration of Independence was signed on May 14, 1948, the 6th of ER, 5708. The state of Israel will be open for Jewish immigration and for the ingathering of the exiles. It will foster the development of the country for the benefit of all its inhabitants. It will be based on freedom, justice, and peace as envisaged by the prophets of Israel. It will ensure complete equality of social and political rights to all its inhabitants, irrespective of religion, race, or sex. It will guarantee freedom of religion, conscience, language, education, and culture. I could read these words over and over again. Their vision of a Jewish state is so deeply inscribed on my heart and the hearts of so many of us. They best exemplify our hopes for a Jewish people once powerless and victimized to build a state, a safe haven for Jews and a home for all those living there based on the principles of justice and dignity for all. Israel is not a fantasy, it is a state. It was born on a piece of land surrounded by aggressors attacked over and over again. And in fact, Yom Kippur, this Yom Kippur is the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. 75 years after its founding, Israel's deserts have bloomed. Your probably names are on half of the trees in that desert. <laughs> Israel is a leader in science and technology and though aggressors still surround this tiny piece of land in the Middle East, Israel is a military superpower. Nuclear Iran is still an issue. Terror attacks are on the rise. But the greatest threat to Israel now is coming from the inside. Israel is breaking. It's as if the words on the Declaration of Independence, with all their promises, have flown off the parchment and been replaced by an ultra-nationalist, Jewish supremacist, racist, hateful, homophobic government. A government that is steering this thousands-year-old project in the making on the course of destruction. It is an existential threat. None like Israel has ever seen. And it's not only about reasonableness and a judicial coup. It is also about the brokenness that we have not been willing to see. Zionism and Israel have become a religion for American Jews. We love the idyllic visions of young immigrants dancing on kibbutzim, settling the land. We love, myself included, the pictures of soldiers at the Kotel in 1967 during the Six-Day War when Jerusalem was reuni reunited. We love all the advances that Israel has led in technology and medicine, all real, all true, and yet, those pictures are not the whole story. We have not been willing to see the inequality that pervades Israeli society between Jew and non-Jew. The deference given to the ultra-Orthodox and how corrupt religion has become and how polarizing the country, polarized the country is between the religious and secular. We have not named how the trauma of the Holocaust plays into the psyche of a country with immense military power, but eternally sees itself as the victim. 
we have not been willing to acknowledge the indelible impact of the occupation of the Palestinians on the soul of our people and the state. For the last eight months, hundreds of thousands of Israelis have been protesting in the streets, raising their voices, trying to lift up the sparks of what Israel could and should be. And this past week, many of us participated in similar demonstrations on the streets of New York with the arrival of Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu. And we should continue to support these protests and the organizations leading the way for justice, dignity, and equality, and our dream of a Jewish democratic state of Israel. But I want to ask a deeper question. Why are we so reluctant to use the principles of our tradition to take a real look at what Israel has become and our relationship to it? Over its long history and evolution, Judaism has always been willing to look at rupture and brokenness, even shattering, not turning away from it, but growing from it, not excusing the complications, but responding to them, not suppressing the truth of what we see, but dialoguing with it, arguing with it, building from it. We express our loyalty to our tradition when we engage with it, no matter how complicated it is. Our commitment to Israel will be most holy when it doesn't idealize or excuse Israel, but instead holds Israel accountable to that vision so powerfully articulated in the Declaration of Independence. It will require of us, demand of us, that we look at what is breaking and what is broken and do our part to lift up the sparks and participate in the repair and being willing to carry the brokenness with us into the future. In the Talmud, Rav Yosef teaches that both the tablets of the covenant and the broken tablets were placed in the ark. Roger Kamenetz writes beautifully about this image. The broken tablets were also carried in an ark insofar as they represented everything shattered, everything lost. They were the law of broken things. How must they have rumbled, clattered on the way, even carried so carefully through the wasteland, how they must have rattled around until the pieces broke into pieces, the edges softened, crumbling, dust collected at the bottom of the ark, ghosts of old letters, old laws, insofar as a law broken is still remembered. The writer Sabrina Ora Mark writes, I imagine the broken tablets leaning against the unbroken ones, telling them secrets only broken things know. Why didn't we just leave the broken tablets behind? What good is all this carrying? To know your history is to carry all your pieces, whole and shattered through the wilderness, and feel their weight. It is not only the world that is broken, it is not only Israel that is broken, it is you and me. The Zohar teaches that the human heart is a holy ark, an Aron HaKodesh. Reshit Chochmah, the 16th century, writes that just like the ark that stores both the whole tablets and the broken tablets, a person's heart must be full of Torah and must be a broken heart so that it can serve as a home for God's presence. Welcome home, community of the brokenhearted. We are in good company. Let us open our hearts and be a home for God's presence. Let us lift up the sparks. Let us search for the light. Let us inscribe our hearts with Torah and come to be our authentic selves. Let us be willing to break what is not working let us tell the secrets that broken things know, broken people know. Let us imagine what can be born in the rupture. And please God, please God, let us emerge from this day with a new story so that we can carry it along with our broken pieces into the wilderness.